And in this meditation, we are going to uh, do the real exercise of the call of Christ the King. How hard is our life going to be if we follow the King? That's a big question. I wanted to uh, recall as an illustration this great book which was used uh, for a movie which was used for the theme of ignition this past year unbroken maybe some of you have seen the movie and maybe some of you have read the book if you haven't read the book yet the book is way better than the movie absolutely worth reading uh, it's the story of Louis Zamperini, who was a pilot in World War II. His plane crashed on the Pacific. Three of the men survived in the lifeboats, and they spent some 40 days out on the Pacific, uh, surviving, fishing, fighting off sharks, getting shot at by fighter jets. An incredible story of how they survived. So two of them survived those 40 days. And a uh, very important part of the story that, that is kind of left out in the movie is that they went through a dry spell where there was no rain and they couldn't drink the salt water. So they were practically dying of thirst. And Louis is laying there emaciated. His, uh, you know, his thirst is just driving him crazy. And he was never practicing Catholic, he, never, he was raised Catholic, but never, never believed in God, and never prayed. At that moment he prayed, he said, God, if you send me rain, I will give my life to serving you. And the book describes how at that moment, clouds appeared in the sky, and it started raining, out of nowhere, miraculously. So they were rescued by God, saved from dying of thirst, and then captured by the Japanese. Woohoo! So, so, you know, the, the funny thing is that eventually, you know, they survived in the end thanks to being captured by the Japanese. But it also meant that they had to go through years of torture and years of being moved from one slave labor camp to the next, and barely surviving. And there was this one Japanese commander who just had it in for Louis Zamperini because he was an Olympic runner beforehand and he hated people who were successful. And this guy was like de demented, really messed up, and just wanted to beat him and torture him as much as he possibly could. So the movie does a pretty good job of showing that part. Uh, but then at the end, he actually makes it through and makes it home. And the movie ends there. But after the war is when the real battle began, because this guy suffered from serious PTSD, like um, the kind where you have flashbacks where you actually believe that you're there, you know? So he said that he would be sitting in a bar or something, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden he'd be back in war and being tortured by people and fighting back. And, uh, and then he'd snap out of it and he'd be like writhing on the ground in the middle of the bar. And everyone's like staring at him like, oh my gosh, what's wrong with this guy, you know? Uh, so really horrific stuff, the, the flashbacks. And he went into a severe depression and started drinking and became, became an alcoholic. And he had it in his head that his only way to escape this was to go back to Japan and get revenge. So he was planning and making efforts to actually get back to Japan so that he could go and kill some of his torturers. And uh, in the meantime, he got married. And, uh, <laughs> can't leave that out of the story because his wife put up with a lot of, a lot of trouble from him, uh, but stayed with him. And eventually his wife started becoming Christian and she went to this Billy Graham revival in a tent. And so Billy Graham was this big Christian preacher, right? Very, very famous. So she was impressed and decided to bring him along. He didn't want to go. She dragged him to this, to this tent revival and he went one night, but he hated it. And he left like halfway through. And then she managed somehow to get him to come a second time. And he was there in this, this Christian tent revival. 
and they were inviting people to come up and give their lives to Jesus. And he's like, I can't take this anymore. So he gets up to leave. It was a, it was a dry evening. And on his way out of the tent, he had one last flashback. And it was a flashback of the moment that he was on the boat dying of thirst. And he was living it like as if it was real, like as if it was actually happening. And he remembered the prayer, and he remembered the clouds, and he could feel the rain pouring over him. Such a good story. <laughs> and, uh, and then he snaps out of it and realizes that he's, you know, in California where it's dry and there's no rain. And he turns around and goes back up to the front and gives his life to Jesus. And that day he was cured of his alcoholism. He threw away all of his alcohol. He never got tempted again to have another drink. And he started sharing his testimony with everybody. Gave, really gave his life to serving the Lord. And what he did end up doing, which, which comes out in the text at the end of the movie, is that he, he did go back to Japan, but not to get revenge, to forgive the, the guards. Um, I'm pretty sure that the one main guy who was hurting him so badly uh, didn't show up for the meeting when he offered his forgiveness to the rest of them. So this is an example of, of sacrifice and of heroically living the gospel, the gospel of forgiveness. I use this story in homilies that have to do with the Sermon on the Mount because it is such a heroic message of forgiveness and living out the way of Christ. So the call of Christ the King is the meditation when we picture ourselves, picture to ourselves Christ as if he were an earthly king coming to us to propose to us his campaign and inviting us, if we want, to come and follow him. And it's such a good exercise, it's so wise and, you know, thanks to St. Ignatius for giving us this idea because it gives you the opportunity in your heart to lay before you, before yourself, the, the good and the bad and the ugly of following Christ and to make a decision. Am I gonna follow this leader or not? But he wants it to make it really real. So he proposes that we, that we imagine it as if it were a worldly leader. In his time there were kings who would go on campaigns and they would send out messages around the countryside asking for people to volunteer to come and be soldiers or fight on their campaign. And uh, that's the image that he wants to use for, for Christ making his proposal to us. For me, this has always been a very effective meditation and I think it works, it helps to go through those steps. The first step is like, what would I do if I were in that scenario? And the second step is, I am in that scenario, spiritually speaking. And the third step is, so what should I do? <laughs> what should I do now? with my life. And you can also have fun with it. You can imagine different ways of modernizing this. If you like the medieval format, you can use the king. If you want to imagine a president, but a good president, <laughs> it's really hard to imagine. But you can do that. You can do that, you know, a president. Imagine imagine we get a president who's a, who's a Christian, who's a believer, who's actually virtuous, who has a spiritual director, you know? who's done the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. And he says, look, we're gonna win over the world for Christ. We're gonna win over the world for Christ, for God. I need an army of missionaries. Will you join me? Or you could take an example like, uh, like World War II, you know? Um, I like the story of uh, Steve Rogers from <laughs> Captain America. You know, such a noble guy who will do anything just to get into the army, right? Because he wants so much to fight in this campaign. That's, that's the kind of person that uh, St. Ignatius describes, you know, someone like Captain America. That might be a little too distracting. I think the best, I think the best example for me would be uh, someone who's going on a mission trip so imagine there's a, there's a priest 
or a bishop or somebody, a great holy religious leader, kind of like a cross between John Paul II and Father Mike Schmitz. Okay, <laughs> great, a great cross. You know, somewhere in the middle there, like uh, like a Padre Pio and Bishop Barron. You know, <laughs> somebody somebody who's like you can look up to, and he's very holy and very passionate, and has a great great vision for what he wants to do in the world, a great project. And imagine imagine he he comes here, okay? He comes here, and he gives a presentation to to the brothers in Cheshire. I'm, he says, I'm here recruiting, and I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. We're going to go on one gruesome mission trip. <laughs> and we're going to sleep in the mud, and there's going to be mosquitoes, and they're going to give us diseases, and we're going to get sick. Okay? And you better be ready to get captured and beaten, arrested, put in jail. Okay? Almost for sure. Um, we're going to travel on foot for days. You're never going to get to shower or sleep in a bed. Uh, the first stop is going to be at Calcutta, and then we're going to go all over India, but we're going to cover the whole countryside, and, and we actually have a plan to convert the whole world. Are you willing to come with me? <laughs> you know, are you willing to come? I skipped out the details of the plan, right? You can try to imagine what that is, but... The important part is realizing that this is this is kind of like Jesus' proposal to us, you know. Uh, but it's not just that. It's not just all the suffering. You know, we are going to succeed. And when we win the victory, you are not going to believe the celebration and the feasts and the glory that there's going to be. Not worldly glory, right? But but it is going to be the greatest celebration, the greatest victory in the world. So we're just looking for volunteers, and if anyone wants to, they can sign up. There's a little sheet being passed around. Put your name and your phone number down, and uh, if you want to, you can come along. I think I would totally go, <laughs> you, know? you know? It's like sometimes the, sometimes our superiors do that with crazy missions, like, uh, like does anyone want to go to Poland? You have to learn Polish, <laughs> right? It's very hard. Um, you know, Brother Andrew Tori is going to Germany. I don't know how good his German is, but that's going to be challenging, you know? Sometimes sometimes we are challenged by these, these uh, great missions, the greatness of the mission to save, to save the world. This example helps us to think of the total irrelevance and superficiality of anything that we could be attached to that would stop us from from saying yes. Because if a great holy leader came and had a great holy plan and victory was certain, although a lot of suffering was certain as well, you know, all of the other little things we're attached to, who cares? Who cares about all those things? And that is Christ. So the next point is to consider Jesus. Consider how Jesus Christ is actually standing before you and he is proposing something very similar. He proposes what we have in the Gospels. Especially the Sermon on the Mount. It's kind of like Jesus' manifesto. It's written in a very old-fashioned way, a very uh, Jewish way, but he's got the essentials of his manifesto right there. He proposes it in the short version in the Beatitudes. So if you want to, you can make your own summary of Jesus' proposal by flipping through those three chapters. You can start with the, the Beatitudes, and if that's enough for your meditation, then just use that. He describes what he wants there. Poor in spirit. You're going to be poor. You've got to be detached from everything. But yours will be the kingdom of heaven. If you are going, willing to be one who mourns, you will be comforted. If you're willing to be one who is meek and hungers and thirsts for righteousness and is merciful, 
and is pure of heart and is, is a peacemaker. And verse 10, the one who is persecuted, then you'll have everything. Jesus, uh, Jesus gives us this proposal. Our goal is to conquer the world with my love, to save every soul. I have this mission and I have the power to do it. I'm going to win the victory, by the way. But I need your help. Are you willing to do all those things? Are you willing to be poor, have no pride or possessions, to be hungry and thirsty? Are you willing to suffer persecution? I love uh, this part from Matthew 5, 38, and the following verses. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, offer no resistance to one who is evil. When someone strikes you on your right cheek, turn the other one to him as well. Think of Louis Zamperini. I think while he was actually suffering all those things, he wasn't just turning the other cheek because he wasn't a Christian yet. But afterwards, afterwards he learned to respond in Christ's way. If anyone wants to go to law with you over your tunic, hand him your cloak as well. Should anyone press you into service for one mile, go with him for two miles. Give to the one who asks of you and do not turn your back on the one who wants to borrow. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus' manifesto is his plan for saving the world. It's tough. It's really tough. It requires us to be ready to turn the other cheek requires us to be ready to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us. And the best way of reading this is to see Christ in, in the whole thing, to see Jesus Christ as the one who lives all of this perfectly. I have a quote from St. Benedict who says, in truth, he's referring to the Beatitudes, right? Blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek. The blessed one, par excellence, is only Jesus. He is, in fact, the true poor in spirit, the one afflicted, the meek one, the one hungering and thirsting for justice, the merciful, the pure of heart, the peacemaker. That's, that's something to meditate, to, to internalize. How Jesus is already living all of these things that he's calling us to, that he's challenging us to live, that he's inviting us to take on as our way of life. He already lives them perfectly, especially the one persecuted. Jesus is already the one who's already gone through the great persecution of giving his life for us. Uh, the same goes for that other passage I read, and for the whole thing. But, you know, he says, he says, do not resist an evildoer. Jesus did not resist those who did evil to him. The one who, one who strikes you on the cheek, turn him the other cheek as well. Jesus already did that. Uh, if someone if someone takes your cloak, then give him your coat as well. Jesus already gave up all of his clothing on Calvary. If you are forced to go for one mile, then go for go for two miles. Jesus was forced to walk carrying the cross. You know, you can take the whole thing and apply it to Christ. He's the one who lives out his teachings. He's the only one who actually like does everything that he says. No, zero hypocrisy at all. And, and he's inviting us to take that path. Love those who persecute you. Pray for those who persecute you. Jesus prayed for those who were crucifying him from the cross. And that's, that's his great invitation. Will you, will you follow me? So let's do this meditation. It's, uh, it's a real exercise. The goal, the goal is to make the decision more, to make the decision more than you have in the past. 
I know you've already decided to follow Christ, but, but I'm going to follow you more closely, Lord. Because your, your plan is the best. Your plan is the best plan, and I want to embrace it fully. With all of its hardships, with all of its difficulties. Because you set the example for me.